I mean, at that time, hip hop was crazy. And it was like, there were all sorts of personalities. I had to disarm people and take their mm. guns. I remember Heavy D. <laughs> I love Heavy D. I remember Heavy D was like, I've heard things about you. <laughs> Because I used to stand at the doorway and not let people... My AD was Big Mike, who was huge. Six, six. Yeah, yeah. And Mike uh-huh. would be like, I ain't doing that shit. And so I'd stand there, I'd be like, you're not coming on my set unless you drop that gun. And they'd be like, Are, is she is she for real? And I'd be standing there and I'm like... And he's like, is she for real? And everybody would be like, yeah, man, serious is a heart attack. <laughs> I was like, you're not getting on my set with that gun. No one's getting on my set. You have to like stay off my set or drop the gun. I don't care. Um... And it taught me how to deal with budgets. More mm. importantly, it taught me how to, because um, I started off editing my stuff. So um, I learned so much about motion and editing and cutting motion together and music. Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is a podcast on directing for anybody that's quite simply ever watched anything. Pete converses with a wide range of fellow directors, writers, actors, showrunners, producers, executives, and more on a journey to determine just what makes a good director and why we'll always need stories. The Director is Pete Chapman's digital studio, built on the pillars of craftsmanship that ensure a unique vision. I'm talking about story, innovation, perspective. Learn more about the director, and better yet, get your official director's chair wear by visiting www.drctr.video. That's drctr.video. All right, people, what's up? Welcome to episode 16 of Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. Uh, It is Saturday. September 19th, and we are one day after the passing of the Honorable Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and it is a sad day um, because we are already seeing the hypocrisy of Republican politics take shape uh, before the woman's body has even been put in the ground. They have And by they, I'll attribute they to Mitch McConnell. They have already declared that they intend to fulfill her seat expeditiously. And for those of you who remember back in 2015, when Justice Scalia died, I believe that was in February of 2015, um, not September of the election year, um, they, I'm sorry, 2016, uh, They were saying that we need to let the people decide and we can't uh, put let the Democrats uh, even have a hearing around Merrick Garland, uh, who was Obama's choice to fulfill um, his nominee to fulfill the seat uh, left by Scalia. And, you know, at this point, obviously, um, this is Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman, and we're here to talk about directing and storytelling and people and their crafts. But it is uh, it's no longer a time for anybody to skirt around these issues. I believe that we are all at a there's a line in the sand and we've got to make clear where we stand and who we're fighting for. Um, This Supreme Court has the opportunity, uh, you know, and it's not even have what you even opportunity is positive, but uh, opportunity uh, or the, uh, you know, the negative opportunity here of being six, three, to the conservative majority. And those are uh, uh, the the decisions that come out of the court are things that don't affect your life necessarily today um, in every case, um, but they change, they have the ability to change society. Imagine Roe v. Wade not passing in 1973. Um, imagine uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was instrumental in uh, Virginia Military Institute allowing women, allowing the, uh, imagine these things not happening and what they do for decades and generations to a society. And so I think, I just think it's important to kind of make sure we're all aware of what's going on here. You know, people are out here finding ways to justify their support of Trump. 
which is, I just have to say, is ridiculous. Um, if you're able to find something to uh, make that decision palatable for you, uh, there is really a lack of humanity and understanding what all the things that come with that guy in that house actually mean to all the people in this country. And so, you know, we all have to do our part. We all have to vote. I don't want to hear anybody complaining out there about um, their vote means nothing. That's fucking bullshit. Your vote means a lot. It actually means everything. You may not get everything that you want, but you don't get everything that you want in any part of your life. I imagine people would love to have gourmet meals every day meal, particularly dinner of every day of their life. But guess what? Sometimes you have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or you have a can of soup or you do what you got to do because you got to eat. And at this point, it's about survival and it may not necessarily be yours, but there are people for whom survival is paramount on a vote that gets tyranny out of the Oval Office. And so here we go. Today's episode, we welcome Millicent Shelton. She's a fabulous director. She's known for 30 Rock, uh, Insecure. Uh, she's someone who I shadowed on Ballers and who also uh, put me in the episode driving a golf cart. So I'm forever thankful for her for not only shadowing, but getting me up on TV in an HBO show that I enjoyed. Um, she has a pilot coming called Run the World. She has directed an episode of P Valley on Stars. For those of y'all who have watched that, um, she's done 911, seven episodes of Blackish, Hunters on Amazon, multiple episodes of Tell Me a Story, uh, The Walking Dead. I mean, the list goes on and on. And what's really impressive is that she's Emmy nominated for 30 Rock. Um, that's a comedy. She does comedy and drama. Um, just a really deft hand, a really specific eye, and a really awesome person who uh, told me that uh, she does not do interviews like this. So I hope y'all will appreciate it and be thankful and enjoy. And I will check back in with y'all after the jump and probably tell you more about voting and making sure that your voice is heard um, because we all have to use ours. So here we go, Millicent Shelton. Roll sound. Speed. The interview. Take one. Action. Let's welcome Millicent Shelton to the podcast. I have to say um, first, so people know who they're listening to, that of I shadowed many a director and only one director called me on a Saturday between shooting and <laughs> said, are you getting what you need? Oh. And I don't know if you remember that, but you did that. <laughs> And honestly, that was like, that was a character defining thing for me. And it was also oh, wow. super helpful because shadowing is often you shut the fuck up and you watch and right. you ask a question when you get an opportunity. And I, I think we might have chatted for an hour, maybe. I don't even know. But like, mm -hmm. just thank you again for that before we really get in. Oh, um, you're welcome. You were a fabulous shadow. Obviously, because hey. you, you, you catapulted into director dumb fabulously. <laughs> By, with no small uh, uh, assist from you. Um, so uh, also for the folks, you might hear my dog Motown barking in the background, but that's just going to be life today. Your um, dog's name is Motown. That's fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Entrepreneur music. Um, so tell me, so you're from St. Louis. Um, yes. How did you, um, and you? I, I know you went to Princeton with mm -hmm. eyes on being a lawyer first, but yes. uh, before the transition, did you, was there something, had you connected to story and storytelling and kind of put it on the back burner? Or like, how did you end up pursuing law instead of this directorial uh, path? Because I grew up in St. Louis. My dad was a doctor, my mom was a nurse, and it was the only thing you did was you were either a doctor or something in the medical field in my family. And I'm a hypochondriac and I really don't like sick people and I don't like blood. So they knew that that didn't work for me. So if you weren't a doctor, then you were um, a lawyer. That was like the only two options that were presented to me and that were acceptable to my father. It was like there was, there was no other option. So in St. Louis, 
at that time, the thought of going into the arts just wasn't in the sight lines. Mm. So no, I hadn't connected with being an artist really. I mean, I always used to draw. And what's interesting is when I was at Princeton and I had to, to pick my majors when it all started to come together, I had taken a, I had been a, between my freshman and sophomore year, I had worked for two of my cousins who were lawyers. I'd interned for them. Mm-hmm. And they were divorce lawyers. And it was the most boring thing I'd ever, <laughs> ever witnessed in my life. And I remember sitting in this little cubicle that had no windows. And it was like three feet wide and like six feet deep. It was literally like this little tiny rectangle. And I was sitting there looking up cases and getting them information. And I thought, if I have to do this, for the rest of my life, I will kill myself. <laughs> I was like, I can't, I cannot do this. And I, 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 it was this whole crisis of like identity. It was like, well, what do I do? I can't be a doctor. I don't like sick people. And um, I can't be a lawyer because it's really boring. Like, so what option is there? And so then my dad was like, you can go into business. Cause then it was like, business was the thing. Oh, okay, so business. And they had, um, at the time there was this seminar or something over at um, Harvard for uh, black Harvardians. And <laughs> there was a busload of Princetonians that went up there and I was actually driving the bus. It was a van. And, and we got up there for this like convention or whatever. And I kid you not, of the hundred guys there, 90 of them had the exact same blue suit and red tie on. And I had been wearing my friend Chuck Shorter's um, uh, they were multicolored, uh, what was that, paisley, tight pants. I was wearing boy <laughs> pants and this big oversized shirt. And I looked at these people and I was like, I don't belong here. <laughs> I don't know. And so I was like, what am I going to do? I don't, I have no idea what I'm going to do. I don't know what, I don't know what I want to do. I can't do any of these things because I don't fit in. I've never been a person, even when I grew up in St. Louis. And I left St. Louis because I never fit in. I knew I didn't belong there. And I was like, I don't belong there. I don't belong in business. And I don't belong in in, um, medicine or or law. So what do I do? And my mom had said, you know, do do what you love. I was like, I don't know what I love. (laughs) I have no idea. And at Princeton, they have uh, reading periods before exams. And so it's two weeks. So for two weeks, because I've always, always been very dramatic. So I stayed in my room <laughs> and my friends would come and bring me food. And I was like, I need to decide what it is that I love. What is it that I love? And it was crazy because I ended up think watching television and movies. And I said, you know what I really love? I like television and movies. I, that's what I love. And, and my mom was like, well, try to figure out what you can do. And I remember, uh, then I remember that in school we had um, creative writing classes. And I always loved that. And I did used to write short stories, but it was just like Mm -hmm. a thing that I did. And I never really thought about it as an avenue, as something that I could do for a living. And so I I went to my academic advisor and I said, "Um, you know, I know what I want to do. I want to be a writer. I want to be a screenwriter. And she was like, hmm, no. (laughs) (laughs) And I I was like, wait, it says that I can major in anything. It says, it says it in the book. I remember the, the Princeton manual was there. I opened it up. It says, it says, I can major in anything. I can make, I can make a major if I want to. And she was like, yeah, we don't have the classes to support that. She said, well, we have one professor, um, Professor uh, P. Adam Sidney. And uh, if he agrees to do your junior thesis and your thesis, be a junior thesis and your thesis advisor, then maybe you can figure we can scrap together you know, a major. And I was like, okay, I go to him and he's like the devil Santa Claus. He's like, he, he, he wore a three piece suit and he had like the monocle and the, and the, um, the half chewed cigar in his mouth, Uh but uh he had this long beard, but it was half Brown and half gray. And he was really super mean. (laughs) And he wouldn't talk to me. He said, I said, I will not talk to me. And let me preface this by saying, I still talk to professor Sydney. And he's amazing, and he he has he changed my life. But um, he said uh, he asked me because have you ever read a screenplay? And I said no. And he goes, well, how do you know you're going to be a screenwriter if you've never read a, a screenplay? And I was like, well, good point. So he he made me take this graduate course that um, took place on Thursday nights, and I was notorious for I only took classes from Monday 
through Thursday morning because Thursday afternoon I was on a train to New York and we used to hang out in New York until Sunday morning mm. and get on a train back. So I was always in the city. We were sleeping on friends' floors or sleeping in the train station. It was completely crazy. So I was like, you want me to not go to New York on Thursday night? <laughs> I was like, uh-huh. hmm. So I took this graduate course that I got no credit for. I got a, I ended up getting an A in it. And then afterwards I was like, well, will you now talk to me? And he was like, no, if you want to, if you want to be a writer, you need to produce something that you've written. So take this course at NYU over the summer called Sight and Sound. And wow. that's what I did. And that course at the end of it, the first day they teach you the camera. Second day you take an exam on it. Third day you're filming in little groups of three. And in, in, I think it was six weeks, you make five films. And yep. the first three were horrible because I didn't grow up with a camera in my hand. And the fourth one, I ended up winning awards for because wow. I figured out that I had always, when I read things, I always saw a strip. I always saw the movie go across my head. And I thought everybody saw things that way. And apparently everybody doesn't. And by the time I got to, to the fourth um, film, I figured out I could stop the strip in my head and then pull each frame. And that was my shot list. Mm. And I figured out I had to shoot everything that I saw or I wouldn't have it to edit back in. And when I did that, and I, I never forget in that seminar, I, when it screened, I used to always sit in the very last row at the very, 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 very back at the top. And, uh, Every, I could hear everybody laugh when they were supposed to. They were emotional when they were supposed to. And I was like, oh, yeah, that was the first time that what I saw in my head, I was actually able to recreate on screen. And it was mm. the most fulfilling feeling I have ever had. And at that moment, I knew that I wanted to be a director. That's It's crazy how there's always, no matter how you land in the job, it's always something that's already there in a way. Because I remember in high school, I had a Super 8 film class and I was doing some ridiculous scenario I created and it was uh, a character coming from the train tracks down to the uh, street level Mm -hmm. and something told me like, okay, I got her on the platform. Now, what if I just shoot this AT&T bell sign and tilt down as she walks up to the phone? And it's like, Everybody else had shot walking down the stairs, grabbing the door, coming out. And and it's just crazy. Like the intuition is there and you can't even explain it. But like much like the way you saw um, the the film strip that you could just buckle down and pause. Um, But that's the most important thing is trusting your gut as a director. Because a lot of times on set, people will be like, why do you want to do that? I go, I literally have to say sometimes, I don't know, but (laughs) I trust my gut at this point. I trust my gut and my gut's usually correct. I was like, I don't know. I just have this thought. It's this crazy thing that's hitting me. And my gut says, do this. Is there anything from your um, pursuit of a law degree that you find has transferred as a useful skill as a, in, in the directing chair? I think my education, not the pursuit of a law degree. Um, mm-hmm. I think my education has taught me how to research really well. I mean, there's a project right now that, I just put together that, whoo, it's a, it's a biographic old piece. Um, and it's the gamut of this person's life was over six decades. And for myself and the writer to condense that to like um, a 10, eight to 10 episode limited series mm-hmm. was challenging. It was probably the most challenging thing I've had to do. I mean, I had books and notes and there was so, I mean, there was so much material and I think we, we've done a really great job, but that came back to my, my ability to study well and to organize, which came from my education, from my schooling. Right. Right. So when you, you get to, you do this, uh, over a summer at Princeton and then you graduate Princeton and you go to NYU. So how did, how did that turn happen? Well, there was a year in between there. Because after I graduated from Princeton, I didn't have a job. <laughs> and my dad was really mad at me because when I told him I wanted to be a director, he said, you need to marry somebody rich or you're going to be poor for the rest of your life. And I was determined to, to make him wrong <laughs> at 
any cost. And I was like, and I'm not going to do anything else but work in this industry. And so I had um, sent off cover letters and resumes to shows, you know. And Wait, do you think he knew that would make you react that way? No, he was serious. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you had ever met my father, he was dead serious. Okay. <laughs> he was like, I don't want to have to pay for you for the rest of your life, and you're going to be poor. I was like, I am not going to be poor, and I'm not going to marry anybody rich. I'm going to make this happen on my own. Because what, what drove him to be that hard on me is also inside of me, that part of my father's inside of me. So that mm -hmm. drive to succeed, you know, um, just to prove him wrong, that hard headedness is sometimes really beneficial. Sometimes it gets me in trouble, but for the most part, it's, it's been a really good thing for me. And that comes from my dad. My dad had a drive to do things that, you know, he was born in Mississippi, um, in 1923. Mm -hmm. And uh, he lived in a place where there was dirt roads and he had nine brothers and sisters and he became a doctor because his grandfather said, you're smart, you can make a better life. And so he did. Wow. So he had vision and I have vision and he wasn't able to stop mine. <laughs> and then ultimately <laughs> he became very um, proud of me. But I sent in cover letters and resumes to shows and didn't know there was a thing called hiatus. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't heard it back from anybody. And I had graduated from Princeton um, right before I left. My sister actually went to Yale with Spike Lee's brother, David. And this is when Spike was just sort of starting out. School days had just come out. And um, I wasn't really hip to Spike Lee, you know. And I knew David. And uh, my sister had said, literally, she called me and said, you know, David's brother's doing a movie. <laughs> and you, literally, it was David's brother. David's brother's doing a movie. Why don't you give him a cover letter and resume and see if you can get on David's brother's movie? <laughs> oh, okay. What's David's brother's name? Spike. Oh, okay. And I looked him up and I went and saw his stuff. I was like, oh, yeah, he's cool, right? <laughs> right. And so Dave, I gave David the letter because David used to come up for like Thanksgivings at, at, at uh, Princeton. So I gave David the letter and then I didn't hear anything. So I went back to um, St. Louis and the first week I was back, I think, I was like, you know, I'm going to call Spike and see, you know, if he got the letter and what he thinks. So I called up and I said, hi, this is Milson Shelton. Nice to meet Spike Lee. And they put him on the phone, <laughs> which is, it'll never happen. I mean, it'll just <laughs> never happen now. I'll never forget it. I was upstairs in my house and he got on the phone and I was just like, I went into the spiel. Like I'm a starving student and I, you know, needed a job and all sorts of stuff. And he said, you know, um, I need to interview you. When are you supposed to be back in New York? And I actually, for my graduation, my parents gave me a gift to Puerto Rico and I had a layover in New York. It's like all mm. things happen for a reason. Right, right. And it was a long layover. So I had time to interview with Spike. And at the end of that interview, he said to me, um, OK, I'll, I'll hire you as an intern. And at that point, I had been offered a job in D.C., that was paying like $300 a week. It was like on this industrial phone. And I said, mm, how much are you pay? He goes, it's an intern, it's free. And I was like, mm, no, I have a job in DC that's gonna pay me $300 a week. And Spike said, if you take that, he probably doesn't remember this. He said, if you take that job, it's gonna be the biggest mistake of your life. Mm. And I said, okay. Um, when do you need me? Oh, no, no. He said, he, I said, okay, I'll take the, I'll take the job. And he goes, um, how soon can you be back here? I was like, I don't know, like three weeks. He said, you have two days. <laughs> that sounds like Spike. <laughs> so I, I went home I told my parents, I'm, I'm going to go back to New York to work on this guy Spike's movie. And uh, bye. I literally left with two bags uh, of all my stuff and I had no money. I slept on my other sister's floor who actually lived close to um, 40 acres. She was like maybe four blocks away. And I slept on her floor and got paid no money. But eventually they bumped me up to, um, I, I worked with Ruth Carter and oh, I was a practice assistant in wardrobe. And I did such a good job that they bumped me up to a PA. And so I got paid like, I think it was like a hundred bucks a week. You know, there's a, a saying that my good buddy Anthony Artis has, which is, I may, I may not have gotten paid, but I never worked for free. I didn't. I did. It's true. And the reason why I ended up getting paid a little bit was because I worked so hard. And I was exactly. like, there's no way that I can take any other job. I thought I could work at for Do the Right Thing you know, during the day and then work at Do Something Else. 
But because mm-hmm. I worked so hard and I was so good, when I did come to them and say I needed money, they were like, we, we, you're valuable. And that's a lesson to everybody. I mean, mm. it, it's important to get your foot in the door. And then it's important to show your ability. Because in, one, in this one very, the thing that's distinguished about this industry is if you work hard and you're smart, people see it. Yeah. And they will move you up because right. that's valuable. And not everybody works hard. And, right. you know, uh, drum roll, not everybody's that smart. No, they're not. <laughs> and when they see it, they're like, oh, oh, here. And they start moving you up as fast as they can, you know? Yeah. And so from 40, from uh, Do the Right Thing, I was on Do the Right Thing, which was an amazing experience. And one day I'm walking through set and, and Spike used to always help me because I would always be standing in front of the monitor because I always wanted to see what he was shooting. And he would scream at me, Sheldon, get out of the way. <laughs> and um, one time he comes up to me and he says, why is the Cosby show calling our uh, production office? And I was like, I don't know. And he goes, the Cosby show is calling our production office looking for you. I was like, I have, I have no idea why they're calling the production office. So it turns out the Cosby show got one of my letters and they called my home. And my mom was like, Oh, well, she's in New York working for this fellow named Spike. And literally, he said it because that's my mother. For this fellow named Spike. Gave him the production office number. They're calling me. And so then I call them back, and they're like, what are you doing on Spike Lee's set? And I was like, I'm a production assistant in a wardrobe. And they're like, would you like to do that for a season on The Cosby Show? And I was like, yeah, how much are you paying? So for two weeks, I worked nights at Cosby. I mean, uh, days at Cosby and nights on uh, Do the Right Thing because they were doing all the fire. And then I did a season on The Cosby Show. Wow. And during hiatus, I shot a short film. And then I got Spike and uh, Mr. Cosby to write me a letter of recommendation for NYU. And that's how I got into NYU. Wow. So I, I want to keep going, but this is ironically timed because tomorrow I'm interviewing uh, Barry Alexander Brown. Um, uh, yeah. Editor of yes. all the Spike films. Yes. Uh, so that should be... Uh, Will he, will he have seen you? Will he remember you? Probably not. I was uh, Shelton. I was Shelton, the, the PA in wardrobe. No, he will uh, not remember me. This is Spike a beautiful, remembers me. I still know Spike. This is a beautiful story. I love this kind of stuff. Um, all right, so then you go to NYU, and uh, you win... Was it the, uh, gosh, I, I don't want to get WTC the WTC Johnson Scholarship. WTC Johnson Scholarship. Yeah. Um, and so... While you're at NYU, you're kind of beginning to make the transition to music videos or like how how is how are you how are you finding your path? Because it sounds like you had the this supercharged entrepreneurial spirit on top of this creative acumen that you were uh, finding the path to for, you know, I had made myself a promise that I wasn't going to work in anything outside of the industry, which made me really hungry and Mm -hmm. skinny um, because I couldn't afford food. But I, when I started, when I finished Cosby, there was a break before I was supposed to start NYU. Like, I think we finished Cosby like in February, March and school didn't start until August. So I had a big gap and I was like, what am I going to do for money? And I ended up uh, getting a job as a a set PA on um, Enemies of Love Story, which was a Paul Masursky uh, period piece that was set in Coney Island, which was amazing. And doing lockups in Coney Island, that's period. <laughs> Cause if you break, if you if you have that corner and the lockup is broke, everybody can see it because it's somebody not in period gear and everybody's right. mad at you. And I remember I used to have these negotiations with people. <laughs> I was like, do not, do not cross, please. You know? Right. So it was when I, I'm on set and I tell set PAs, you know, do this, it's because I've done that job. Mm-hmm. I was like, mm-hmm. I've done that job, I know what it entails. But um, I did that, and then um, I wanted to, I wanted to be close to camera and know what they were shooting. So I got trained by another director right now, who was also on Do the Right Thing, Darnell Martin, and um, she taught me, she trained me with on the camera, and I became a second AC, and I started second wow. ACing on music videos. And during one of those music videos, I was the second AC on a music, a kid and play music video that we actually just recently found pictures of um, that Paris Barkley was directing. And um, I was in the bag, because that's when they shot on 16 millimeter. Yeah. Changing film and you were in the bag. 
Oh, I have a good story about uh, uh, Fight the Power, too. <laughs> but I was in the bag, and Herbie Lovebug, who was their um, manager, came over, producer manager, came over and was talking to me and found out I went to NYU and had this idea for a movie and wanted to write this movie with me because he found out I was going to NYU. And he said, do you write? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I didn't write. <laughs> And we worked on this script because this is when Kid and Play were doing all the um, house parties. House stuff. party, yeah. Yeah, and so we he would fly me all over with them on, and we were trying to like write this movie, and I just became we became really close friends. It was crazy because I was like the crazy girl who was riding with them, and I would like yell at them and tell them they were nasty for all the girls that were with, <laughs> and then they would put me on a different floor. But it was really, it was fun. It was great. Mm -hmm. um, Ken and I are still friends. Harvey and I are still friends. Wiz and I, I mean, you know, they become my buddies for life, but it was a great maturation in the industry. And when I started NYU, um, no, I had showed Herbie my short film once. And he had, someone walked in the room and said, is that the director of the next Salt and Pepper video? And he was like, no. And then later on, he came to me and said, would you like to direct the next Salt and Pepper music video? And I was like, yeah, like, why would I not want to do that? Right. And um, I was hanging out with Kid like months later and he said, you know, that Salt and Pepper song is about to drop. You should hit Herbie up. And I called Herbie and I said, were you serious? And he was like, yeah. And so the first video I ever did, he gave me um, was Salt and Pepper's Expressions. And it was $30,000. No production company would help me. And we ran it out of my East Village apartment. And um, the song was like like number 100 or something on the charts. And then right. when the music video came up, it jumped to number one and stayed there for about 10 weeks. And Herbie asked me to be his in-house music video director. And that was it. And that, that happened like the same time school was happening. Right. And so I would start at NYU and I was directing this music video. And I was sleeping on the floor of my apartment or... I was sleeping on the edit room floor at NYU. I was sleeping on the edit room floor at our um, edit, our edit, our music video production office. That's when I stopped sleeping. I haven't slept since. <laughs> and so, wow. So you went on to do a hundred music videos. Yeah. Uh, probably over a hundred. What What would you say is like? I don't know. What are like the top two or three things that you learned from directing music videos that you've applied to? Um, TV. Um, I learned to manage money and production and crew. Mm -hmm. uh, as a young woman, uh, when I walked on set, everybody thought I was one of the dancers. And so at one point I cut off all my hair and then they thought I was a little boy. So I figured out that really didn't help. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to find my strength, actually. What I ended up finding was my strength and my power and realized that my appearance had nothing to do with my ability as a director. Mm -hmm. um, and to learn how to manage a crew of male, mostly primarily male crew, primarily, actually in New York at the time it wasn't all white, but um, it was primarily male crew. And, you know, I was very young and a girl. Um, it helped me learn to manage artists. There were all sorts of personalities. I had to disarm people and take mm -hmm. their guns. I remember Heavy D. <laughs> I love Heavy D. I remember Heavy D was like, I've heard things about you. <laughs> Because I used to stand at the doorway and not let people... My AD was Big Mike, who was huge, 6'6". Six, six. Yeah, yeah. And Mike uh -huh. would be like, I ain't doing that shit. And so I'd stand there, I'd be like, you're not coming on my set unless you drop that gun. And they'd be like, Are, is she is she for real? And I'd be standing there and I'm like... And he's like, is she for real? And everybody would be like, yeah, man, serious is a heart attack. <laughs> I was like, you're not getting on my set with that gun. No one's getting on my set. You have to like stay off my set or drop the gun. I don't care. Um... And it taught me how to deal with budgets. More mm. importantly, it taught me how to, because um, I started off editing my stuff. So um, I learned so much about motion and editing and cutting motion together and music and angles and lenses and the big toys. Right. But while I was at NYU, I also learned storytelling. So it was a good, it was a good combination. Right. That's interesting because I feel like you know, uh, there are a, a dozen really accomplished music video directors from, uh, let's say, mid 90s to mid 
2000s before or even early 90s before they they the budget shrunk mm -hmm. but not many um were able to gr have a really good foundation in storytelling and make that hop to feature films and later tv um and i remember one director actually had a quote uh, like verbatim saying didn't realize how much story mattered you know oh, really? Yeah, I, well, I won't. I won't name them, but it, you know, people have seen their film, and it and it's crazy because you you can do anything. I I did a few music videos, and I found that I thought too linearly to do oh. it well because I I couldn't just be like you're on a roof for no reason, and <laughs> and, and and the wind's blowing your hair because it's cool because and it looks pretty because it looks pretty like that just wow. I, that wasn't really how I, how I viewed it. So it's awesome watching that transition that you could harness that um when did you leave videos behind and feel confident enough that you were like anchored with a flag in television directing i never did that i am no. not that logical of a human being unfortunately <laughs> i am um like i said i was dramatic i think i was born this way i'm very um emotionally charged uh so for me, it was one day I looked up. Oh, actually, I remember the exact moment. I was talking to a friend and he said, you work in the music industry. And I said, no, I am a director. And he said, no, you work in the industry, music industry. And I said, no, I direct. And he says, who pays you? And I'm like, <laughs> I literally was like, oh my God, I work in the music industry. I don't want to work in the music industry. I am a director. And it, and it coincided again with me like graduating from NYU, uh, coming towards the end of my three years at NYU and having to think about what was valuable to me. And I had made a lot of music videos and I love music. I love visuals. And I had learned so much, but my heart is in storytelling. You know, my heart is in characters. Um, I had done commercials. It really came out when I did commercials and someone started talking to me about um, sheet metal. And I was like, I don't give a damn about sheet metal. <laughs> I don't <laughs> care about sheet metal. And I, but I was in the meeting and I wanted to laugh because I was like, are you? I mean, they talked orgasmically about the product. And I was like, I care about the people and the story. And it just hit me. I was like, that's what I value. And I can do great, fun, crazy visuals. Um, I can do that. I can do, I can do all the style in the world. But um, style without character to me is empty and I find it boring. Right. And so I knew I wanted to transition into something else. And it was actually my um, my thesis story that I wrote for NYU um, was got me into the film industry, which then led me into television. So mm -hmm. it wasn't I wasn't secure. I kind of just jumped off a cliff like I always do. I was like, I want to do right. that. Right. And I just left and I just did enough music videos to keep the lights on pretty much. Right, right, and I, you know, I, 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 I kind of hopped over 1998 when you made a feature, right? Yeah. You, made, you directed and you wrote Ride, um, yes. and it seems like um, that was a a, a kind of nice gumbo of your music industry world and your storytelling world. Like, yeah. how did how did that come together? That actually was based on a real experience where I had to bus. Um, I think it was 20 kids down to Miami um, for a Rex and Effects music video because Teddy <laughs> Riley wanted authentic New Yorkers in, in Miami to be extras. And I was you like- You drove them from New York to Miami? Yes, I remember I was in, I was in bed talking to him on the phone because everyone used to call me at three o'clock in the morning and I was like, yes. And he was like, listen, I want authentic New York extras. I was like, okay, we can find New, York, like New, York, New Yorkers in Miami. He goes, no, 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 no. I want the real shit. I want New Yorkers from Harlem. And I was like, okay, so we're moving the music video to Harlem? He's like, no, it's going to be in Miami. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, you can't afford to bring all those extras in a plane. He was like, I don't care. Put them on a bus. I'm like, okay. Man. And it was the most crazy experience ever. We, had, we were supposed to have this beautiful bus. We had researched it. I had threatened my assistant with um, getting fired if she did not ride on the bus to be a supervisor. I went ahead down to Miami and was in prep 
And the bus that showed up was this rickety piece of shit. It showed up <laughs> like 20 hours late. They were outside from the Apollo in the snow waiting. And then they went over to New Jersey and picked up two prostitutes. This is the real story. Picked up two prostitutes. And it was like a hell ride all the way down. The toilet didn't work. They didn't, It was just crazy. It was a hell ride all the way down. My assistant would like, because at that, that time it was pagers. She would page me and she'd be like, this is crazy. Oh my God. And then when they were halfway there, at first it was only supposed to take them two days. And it took them like four. When they were halfway there, the bus company calls me and says, you know, the deal was I was supposed to pay half the money when they left New York and then half when they left Miami to come back. Uh -huh. So we had paid them half the money. And she, the bus company called me and said, we want the other half of the money. I was like, they're late and they're not even down in Miami yet. Are you kidding me? She said, if you don't pay us the money, we're going to turn the bus around. Right. And this is me in my gangster days when I used to disarm people. And I was like, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> I was like, you are not. I was like, if you turn this bus around, you will regret it. And she was like, I'm going to turn the bus around. I was like, okay, bet. And so then my assistant te pe um, texts me, I mean, uh, beeps me. So I call her and she's like, you know, they're threatening to turn the bus around. They had stopped and threatened to turn the bus around. And I told her, I said, um, put whoever the head of the posse is on the, on the phone. <laughs> Because I had done this for a while. And she puts the guy on the phone. I was like, yo, by any means necessary, do not let that bus turn around. And he was like, oh, yo, I got you, sister girl. I got you. And I was like, okay. And I hung on the phone. My producer standing next to me, like, shaking and, like, hairs falling out of his head. <laughs> and then, I kid you not, like, three minutes later, the phone rings. And the bus driver screaming on the other end of the telephone. And he's like... They've threatened to shoot me and tie me to the back of the bus and drag me all the way down to Miami. I said, sir, I cannot guarantee your safety if you turn the bus around. I said, but if you take them to Miami, I can guarantee that you will be safe. Right. And they got to Miami. As soon as they got to Miami, the bus broke down, but they got to Miami. I, I knew exactly what that I got you meant. <laughs> oh, I got you. Yeah, that was going to happen. Yeah. That's awesome. I did not know that that backstory, but yeah, so, so, you can't make this stuff up. No, you can't, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah, the real story was much better than the film. I mean, what happened with the film was um, I wrote the script and it was a really sweet script. Um, and it was based on that. And then it was some of based on me being a, a girl, a black girl, but a girl from suburbia, you know, and it was more about um, people from do it more of how people from different social socioeconomic paths of life are mm -hmm. more alike than they are different mm -hmm. um, because that's what they learn around the journey and it was a really lovely script but the producers got it and they destroyed it two days before we started shooting i got the script back because i was not dga at the time and they like mm. took the script and they put all the butt jokes in it they took out all the heart they butchered the character arcs on all the characters and then handed it back to me i remember i never cry i'm hard as rock and I cried. I was right. like, oh my God. And how do you how do you like put your heart into shooting that when it is everything you know it couldn't be? You know, it'll never be what it could have been. It was really difficult. I mean, I think it was one of my biggest tests to date as a director because it almost destroyed me because it you know, you nurture this baby and then your baby's ripped away from you and it's not your baby anymore. And it's got your name all over it. But it's like, that's not what I wrote. Right. That's not what got greenlit. My script is what got greenlit. And then they just changed it. And what I ended up finding out later is that they wanted to direct it, but they couldn't get me off the movie because of my contract. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted me to quit. But the thing, I was like, did no one tell you about me? I don't quit. I, right. I don't. No, right. you didn't really think about who you were dealing with. No matter what, I'm not going to quit. Right. Um, so, you know, it was heartbreaking. And it sent me into a deep depression for a while. I was on like a blacklist. Um, I didn't want to ever do another feature film. I haven't done a feature film mm. since then. I'm just now entertaining the idea because I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. Um, and a friend of mine uh, who was working out in Los Angeles uh, had said, I think you'd be really good at television. Hmm. And I was like, well, because I didn't want to go back to music video. And I was like, yeah, it's a quicker turnaround. 
And I shadow Paris Barkley for like three years on off and on on sets and other directors at the DGA that I would just walk up to because I would see their names and I like their mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. One of them, which is David Nutter, who's also one of my mentors now. But I was like, yeah. David Nutter. I was like, I love your stuff. And to this day, they're still my mentors. And I ended up getting an episode on a show and I've been directing ever since. That's Awesome. You know, I, I think it's also worthwhile for like a brief pit stop for the directors who are listening to kind of hear that we're not talking about shots, right? We're not talking about blocking, like the shit that you actually have to navigate to even get to shots and blocking and telling stories yeah. is what makes you a director, I think, right? Like, yes. can you navigate that wild shit, yes. you know, can you um, deal with the uh, with people coming on set with guns? Like I have a friend who did a music video um, who basically got jumped by the people he did the music video for. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like what the fuck? You know, yeah, and like, Kelly used to threaten all my producers. Yeah. It, I mean, and, and you come out of that. A, you know, never want to do music videos again. But B, you start like you start learning. You can see that coming around the corner mm -hmm. and you get sharper. And then when you go to this world where like I have this theory that that persists in music because you never have to change anything about what you used to do. Right. Because yeah. you got you, you pay for the label. Right. So it's not like you had to go get the money from some other people and start doing business meetings. It's like, yo, here's the video. It's all my money and I can do what I want. Um, yeah. But we used to try to, you know, producers used to try to save artists sometimes because they would, you know, I worked in music video back in the crazy heyday. And we used to say, you know, it's all, this is all coming out of your pocket. Do you really want to spend this much? And they're like, I don't give a shit. And then they're like, oh, you spent all my money. It's like, <laughs> Right. You know, I mean, I've had guns pointed in my face. You know, mm -hmm. um, it, it it helps set me up for now when I deal with actors and everyone says, how do you deal with like, oh, my God, are you scared? And I was like, mm, unless they're going to point a gun in my face, right. there's really, truly nothing they can do to scare right. me. I mean, truly nothing. And that sometimes works in my benefit. Other times it makes people very upset because it just doesn't scare me. I was like, I've had guns pointed right. in my face. You're what are Sam, you going to do to me? Like, yell? What is yelling going to do to me? <laughs> you're Sam Jackson in Pulp Fiction, where at the, at the end, he's like, I hate to disappoint you, <laughs> but this ain't the first time I've had a gun put in my face. Right? It's like, yeah. so, like, when you're on set and you get an actor who's mad at you, it's like, is that, is that not going to rock my world? It's just not. I'm not right. that fragile. Right. And I have music video to thank for that. I'm Molly McGlynn. You are listening to Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. How to Succeed as a Creative Professional is Pete Chapman's upcoming book about his journey as a director. What started in 1993 has been a marathon full of persistence and creative pivots, transitioning from indie filmmaker to teaching at NYU's acclaimed film school to running a production company, to directing television and commercials, and ultimately eyeing a return to the feature films that gave him his start. A mixture of how-to, self-help, and inspiration, this book will be for any person eyeing a successful career in a creative art. How to Succeed as a Creative Professional is coming soon. Once you got into TV, because you were doing comedies more in the beginning with uh, Bernie Mac and Everybody Loves Chris and 30 Rock, for which you were nominated for an Emmy. Um, everybody hates Chris. Everybody hates Chris. Sorry. Yeah. I, everybody <laughs> should love Chris. Um, uh, I, everybody loves Raymond. Yes. Um, and so how did you make the pivot to, to drama? Because I know that's a big thing for a lot of directors. It is. Um, I There was a concerted effort. Uh, I'd like to say that I have director ADD, which I do. <laughs> it's not even I like to say it. I do. Um, and I have this theory that telling stories is telling stories. And good comedy has dramatic moments and good drama has levity. Yep. And so I wanted to be a director that could tell both. And my heart lies in both. And so we made a concerted effort to push to break my, me into drama. Um, at first, it was dramatic, one-hour dramatic comedies. So I could get the one hour underneath my belt. 
And then it was pushing for straight drama. And it was a real effort because it was hard. I had, I can't tell you how many meetings I had with people saying, you do comedy. And I was like, no, it's storytelling is storytelling. And if I understand the arc of a character, I understand the heart of where the comedy is. I can understand where the heart of a dramatic beat is. And I can tell that story. And then I got a couple of episodes and did really well. And um, then people started believing that I could do both. And then after that, after I got into, after I got my feet really um, in drama, so I was securely doing drama and securely doing comedy, then I was like, okay, now I want to do action. Right. And so um, the first action show I got was The Flash. And to this day, I still don't know exactly why they gave it to me. I have a feeling it was David Nutter, but he will not take credit for it. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. he directed the pilot, and I was like, I love this show. I can do this show. I had, you know, cut all the little pieces of little moments that were almost action-y that I had done from music videos and everything and cut it together, had this reel. And then, boom, I got an episode of The Flash, and I did really well with that. And then that morphed into a lot of so, action. So now I do all. You mentioned you cut this reel. Did you present that reel in a meeting or did you send that reel as like, hey, guys, like you're you're uh, let me just show you what I can do in the action yeah. space. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And then when I did The Flash, I met with a lot of action directors and said, you know, how do I do this? And got advice and listened to what they said. And I remember my Flash episode was really long and it came out to be like on the first board was like 12 days. And I was like, oh my God, how are we going to do this? And the visual effects people had their board and stunts had their own pre visits and special effects had their, and, and so I brought everybody together in this little office and locked the door. And I was like, we are going to beat out every sequence together. So we're all on the same. We had the story, poor little storyboard artist was there like drunk. We went through everything, so we were so all on the same. And I heard everybody. I was like, "You stunts, what do you say? You special effects, what do you say? Right. You who was it? Um, whoever else, no visual effects, what do you say?" And we all. It was this crazy meeting, but it was the best thing I ever did, mm-hmm. and um, that came from me talking to other directors and trying to figure it out. I was like, I, "This needs to be brought together," and so we were all on the same wavelength, and we put out a really great episode and that just made it possible. I got other episodes of the flash and from there I moved on. And, and would you say what you, what ended up in the cut was very close to what you collectively collaborated to, to sculpt out? Yeah. That that, the flash you shot the boards. And so our boards were what we all agreed on. Mm. So it was very much like a commercial in some respect. At that point for the action. Yeah. Yeah. We shoot the boards. The, uh, it was required for us to submit the boards to the uh, showrunner ahead of time. Mm-hmm. And then you had to shoot the boards. You could do right. a little extra, but you had to shoot the boards. Right. Here's a, I, this is more, and this question's for me, so sorry, listeners. But um, <laughs> <laughs> when uh, considering like, like we're doing, uh, we're in the middle, uh, while we record this, we're in the middle of uh, kind of the Emmy voting. And there's yeah. so many shows, like when you first get the nominations, I mean, it, it's, it's going to take you a while to go through every category and every project. And uh, then the nominated shows kind of rise to the top. How does something like Apollo Apollo from 30 Rock like rise to the point of being nominated it, from from your perspective? Like, is it the con? Like, is it? I, I'm trying to understand because it seems like somewhat of a popularity contest. It is but, a popularity contest. Um, I think it is largely a popularity contest. Um, back then, there wasn't as much content as there is now. Mm, right. So, um, but I do think. Uh, you know, no, just, I mean, I don't mean to diss anybody who's won awards because what, awards are great. I've won some and I, I really love it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, award shows tend to be, just by the nature of what they are, they tend to be a popularity contest because you tend to go for shows that you know or names that you know. You know, that's what you look at, especially because now there's so many. You're like, right. I, there's, no, there's no way I can watch all of this content. Right. You know, so um, at that time, 30 Rock was a big show. Um, my episode came out, was really, was really, it was, it was what I said, it was comedy with heart. Mm-hmm. 
Um, the show had put my episode up. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, I, I think it just took off. I mean, I largely didn't have that much to do with it. Right, right. Outside okay. of the fact that I directed it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, which is everything. And in and, and, and all <laughs> honesty, I have this conversation all the time, and it's um, TV is the writer's medium, and there's no doubt about that. But there are also uh, episodes that are not as well executed as others because right. of who's in the chair. Um, and uh, it, that's what I love about the DGA because we all know what happens and there's such a beautiful camaraderie and support system because we recognize like that didn't have to be that good as far yeah. as a, a directed piece of content, right? Yeah. Um, so how did you uh, make the transition to pilots, which is like the, the coveted uh, uh, destination for a lot of directors? I got a pilot soon after the Emmy nomination. I'm actually looking at the poster right now, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> it was awkward for um, MTV that became a series. And it went on for like five seasons. I didn't I didn't work on the show after the pilot. Mm -hmm. um, and to be honest, I did not have a good relationship with the, the showrunner at all. It was not a good relationship <laughs> with the writer, um, which is... I think it, I think that was the reason because I got a lot of backlash from that. Um, when I got the script, I loved it. I knew I could shoot it, and I knew I could make it in a manner that was going to get the show picked up. Mm -hmm. And she was very into I want to be by your side and know everything that you do. And I was like, well, I sit on sets. It was this crazy power struggle that did not have to be what it was. And I'm the type of director, I like to be free. I'm an Aquarian, I like to be free. <laughs> I now am, have the ability to pick and choose shows and I pick and choose shows that that like my creativity mm -hmm. um, and, my, and give me the freedom and the trust to you know, know that my job is as a guest director is to stay inside of the box, but you want to be able to see, you want me to bring something special to it within that box. Right. You don't want me to be invisible. That's why people hire me. You know, and um, we did not have a good working relationship. The show got picked up. And then um, for a while, I didn't get offered another pilot. And it was kind of, it finally, like, pissed me off. And I was like, mm, you know, I should be directing more pilots. And so I made a big, I had to open my eyes. I think for a while, I just put my head in the mud and, like, stayed in episodic directing. Because, you know, I could fill up a slate with episodes and not mm -hmm. have to really go out there. And then just recently I started deciding that, no, I mean, I, I have done this and I want to do something else. I want to go back into the originality kind of what we had with music videos, but right. incorporate the storytelling. And then I started actively saying, you know, I want to direct pilots and the stars pilot just kind of fell into my lap. Right. Right. So, as we start turning the corner here, you know, I wanted to ask you how how did you uh, find yourself, or did you seek out leadership positions in the DGA, uh, and like, and what does that mean to you? Um, when I directed Bride, I ha did it for Dimension Films, and I was a music video director, and they came to me and begged me to do it not in union. And I didn't know anything. I was living in New York. I didn't know anything about the guilds. And I was like, okay. Um, I didn't know anything about the director's guild, really. And they said that they were going to give me everything that the a DGA director would get. And it was in my contract. And then the Weinsteins ripped me off. Mm. They didn't pay me. And my lawyer called me, negotiated, negotiated with them, and called me and said, yeah, they're not going to pay you the money that was written on the contract. They're not going to give you that. And she said, and they said that, yes, we do owe her this. We acknowledge it's in the contract. No, we're not going to pay her this. And she can take us to court. And if she does, we'll bankrupt her. So she advised me, just take what you have and walk away. And I remember being so heartbroken. Hmm. And I think I was talking to Paris Barkley. And he said, you, need, you should have gone union. Because he had done a show for Dimension and they tried the same thing and the Guild had 
attacked dimension because mm-hmm. they have power and they stood up for him and he got paid. And from that moment on, I have been in the director's guild and very loyal to it. And I felt because um, they went on to protect me in later projects right. that I owed them. I still do. It's my right. guild and um, they protected me. And I feel like I have to be there to help lift them up and then um, protect the future of other filmmakers like me. Dope, dope. That, that, it's crazy. I think everybody has a story like that. You know, I have my stories actually come from the music video world. I have oh, wow. I have about twenty thousand dollars still owed to me from, you know, people that you probably know. Oh, I'm sure. Um, Shouldn't yeah. would not pay people. They would, he would hang people outside. Oh, I can't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's it's a it's a damn shame, you know, um, that yeah. you kind of need to protect normal human decency with, you know, a guild of however many thousand people. Um, well, what's what's next? We were talking before the interview about this whole COVID uh, workflow. I'm going to start back to work next week. Um, you mentioned that's coming soon for you a couple of weeks. Like, um, what are your thoughts or concerns uh, about stepping back into this um, pod style production process? Uh, and are there any pros to it that you that you might see Mm, I don't know yeah I I didn't I haven't really I know a lot of people have obsessed over it I had this conversation with a show that I'm gonna go to and one of the they asked me that and I said you know what we're really smart creative people every day on set we're faced with you have 30 minutes to do like nine pages of dialogue (laughs) with 27 people moving how are you gonna do it and you okay and you have to figure it out and you're not going to get any overtime, so what are you going to do? And you sit there and go, okay, 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 I can figure this out. I can do this. I can make this work. So as a people, I mean, as a crew, um, we are faced with obstacles all of the time, and we rise above it, and we figure it out. And I said, I have full confidence in our creative ability to be able to take this moment and rise above it. And, ooh, hold on. That was crazy. Are you still there? Yeah. Yep. Um, to rise above it and to find some something that is special and great about it and to move on. And I do believe that. I mean, I'm, I've, I've read sort of the COVID thing, but I was like, you know what? Someone's going to tell me exactly where I can stand, <laughs> where I'm right. supposed to be. And I'm going to go, okay, to do this scene, I have to do da da da. And I was like, why wreck my brain about it and become nervous? I'm going, because I'm going to Canada and I have to quarantine. So I had to read the document. I have to make sure that my world is a place where I can still be creative and not go crazy. But other than that, I decided that I wasn't going to obsess over the new normal. Mm -hmm. I'll accept it and figure out how I can excel within it. And that's just kind of where I'm at. Do you work digitally or uh, more like paper and pen? We're going to have this conversation, (laughs) aren't we, Pete Chapman? (laughs) I work, I work paper to pen, um, except for when I do storyboards. I actually have a storyboard program that I do. Um, I guess it's, dig- it's digital. Yeah, it's and virtual. you and you can you draw? No, I can't draw at all. It's it's an amazing program. It's called Frameforge Three D Studios. Hold and, on now. Oh uh, yeah, no, it's amazing. I love it. Dope. Okay. Good and, to know. Yeah, and you can create storyboards, and you can, um, because I work off set diagrams, and you can build the set, and it puts up real lenses, and I can get cameras in, and I can know exactly what lens and where, given the space. Like, I'm like, oh, I can get a wide camera in there, because I know that I don't have to bust through a wall. I mean, it's like like cheating beforehand, but I do Uh it. Um, I don't do it for everything, but on big stuff, I do it. Um, And so I do that, but... Uh, no, I actually like a script. I've had conversations right now with they're going to have to give me sides. I can't direct, apparently, without single-sided sides because I write my notes uh-huh. on the sides. I have my assistants going to keep teach me scriptation. But uh-huh. I'm telling you right now, I cannot <laughs> watch. Because when I watch, when I watch an, an, a, 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 a take, I don't, I don't look away from monitor. <laughs> So I'm like this. Right. 
And I write like this. And that's why I write on my sides. And then half of the bonding thing with me and actresses, I walk up and go, what does this say? Because <laughs> you've been there. And I go, what does this say? I don't know what I wrote. And I'm trying to figure out, what is my notes? And so imagine if I try to type that. It'll be like complete gibberish. No one will be able, and I can't type. I'm not that good. I can't type on the little thing like this. And I was like, I I'm going to need sides. So I'm going to try scriptation. She's going to teach me next week. But there's, there's this thing. I have a photographic memory. Mm -hmm. And the way that things lock into my memory is I write it down. And so you can I have to picture see where I, you wrote it and you remember yes, it. And I lock, yeah, and it locks into my brains because I, don't, I have this crazy book. But generally when I'm on set, I don't even open it. Right. But it's part of the process of figuring out, like, I know where this shot goes and that shot goes. I know where I'm going to take this. I know where I'm going to edit this. And I've written it all down, but I never look right. at it. Right. So I'm going to try scriptation, <laughs> but someone's going to have to give me sides that no one else has to touch. They will live in my pocket and I'm right. going to pin and I'm going to write down my thoughts after every take and I'm going to go to actors and go, what does this say? And I'll say, this <laughs> way and hope that they can read it and go, what does it say? <laughs> because that's how I work. Decipher my direction and direct yourself. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's a, well, I, I love I love scriptation. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to even get more fluent in it. But it is it is always tough because you, you're trying to zone in. You got somebody whispering in your ear and you're like, I really no. am not listening to you. Like, <laughs> Stop like I'm, yeah. So do you see what I do is I get the baby monitors. Mm -hmm. And I'm in like usually I'm in a closet. I'm as close to the cameras as possible. But I have you saw me because we were ballers. Yeah. I get the baby monitors and I go to a corner where the because because Video Village has too many people who talk. I don't want you to talk, and I think it's so rude because it's like you guys are done with your job, so you're just like chilling, having a conversation. But this mm -hmm. is all about my job right now is right. focusing and looking and hearing and thinking about what I'm going to change. And I'm like, I want to be I want to be close to the camera operator so I can reset really right. quickly and close to the cast. So maybe the one thing that's good about COVID-19 is I think we'll be closer, you know, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. ability, ability, ability should be smaller. Um, because I just, I like the silence. It's not the people. I don't mind the people. I just want silence because I want to focus on my job. You know, it's right. like I'm focused on what they're saying. I look into eyes and go, you know, what, what, what the eyes really are to me, the window of the soul. So what are they conveying in this moment? You know, right. it's, it's so much more than what most people in Video Village see. You know, they right. sit back and they're just like, da, 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 and it's like, shut up! Yeah, because <laughs> like, oh a, lot, God. a lot of times it's like you'll see some eye moment that they could that the actors connect, and you're like, I got it right there, yeah. and they're like, oh, we need this line reading, and you're yeah. like, I, I, trust no, me. No, you didn't see it. Yeah, because like, you're talking that, about drinks later on right. tonight, and it's like, right. it's not about that. Go someplace else and talk about drinks. I am working right this very second. You know. Right. So um, let, the, the, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about is that now it, it's because you say that I'm good at transitioning. I actually don't think I'm good at transitioning. I think I'm a little late. Um, I think I'm slow to get into pilots. And so I mm -hmm. would advise um, young directors to see their value and always look to be moving up mm -hmm. because that's what the directors that are not of color do. And mm -hmm. I think I should have moved up into pilots a long time ago, but I wasn't in that headspace. And just recently someone said to me, you know, you need to be developing more shows. And I was like, huh. And it had never occurred to me. I thought that mm -hmm. the only people that developed shows were the people who had deals. And mm -hmm. that's just not true. So that's mm -hmm. also an avenue, especially for people of color, to think about, you know, you can develop. And now I'm having, you know, a, a, a COVID has been fabulous for working on shows and developing um, right. ideas and I'm having a lot of movement and it's great and you have more ownership in what you are directing mm -hmm. which is which is a good thing but um, I think again I'm late to the game in, in regards to that so mm -hmm. I wish I had really discovered that earlier right but you know uh, what do they say uh, oh man it's not is I might be Oh God! What's the Ashanti song in Ja Rule? I'm not always oh, there when you call. But I'm on time. But I'm all, <laughs> always on time, or something like that. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's uh, reflective of that. Um, and you know, and honestly, it comes like I've had I've had two uh, pilot meetings, um, and both of which I did not get 
and lost to the same person who's another uh, black director who's done uh, more. Um, uh, he's done producing, directing jobs before. Oh, um, and like, so like, hey, like, uh, and he's a friend. If I, if I, I had to not lose, I'm like, I that's know. my man. Um, yeah. but you know, going for him and trying to at least let them know that I view myself like that. Yeah. I think it's um, important. So my last question before a lightning round question, mm-hmm. what is your, if you can, and I know some directors can't pick a, pick a baby. Um, but, uh, what is what sequence are you most proud of? You know, you don't know. All right. Um, what well, sequence? Yeah. No, finish I, your sentence. Sorry, I cut what, you up. What, what be, sequence? What sequence? Like you know, like I, I answered this on an, on another podcast, and, and and I had to think about it, but I was like, you know what? It was this one thing I did in in Grownish where I was like, I really got to like do something where it was like, all right, guys, here's what's happening. Not like here's the blocking, but here's what we're doing. Here's what the camera's doing. Here's how we're doing this in post. And I need everybody to listen because it's not like what you normally do. But I know that it's what you need in this cold open. And then I watch it and I was like, that shit has survived three cuts on my reel. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, is there like I, I know from what you did, like with the um, Coachella recreation in Insecure, like that was massive and impressive and masterful in 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 different ways than you yeah. might like say the choreography of it might not have, I don't know. I, but I just wonder if there's something where you're like, man, that was fucking hard or, or, or challenging. <laughs> and like, I did that. The Coachella episode of Insecure. I was proud that people who went to Coachella thought that we were really there. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that was one of the biggest points. And we weren't there. We shot on a farm in Thousand Oaks. <laughs> and people who really went to Coachella that year thought we were there. And right. that was the point, and that was the goal, and we accomplished that. So I'm super proud. That I was, I will always be super proud of that. And it took a great deal of work and effort to make that happen. Um, that I did a uh, flash episode called "Welcome to," oh, welcome to something to planet. No, I can't remember. welcome to earth 2 that's what it was welcome to earth Uh 2 and it had a whole bunch of doppelgangers of the characters and it had them fighting each other and visual effects involved with stunts and actors playing two different parts fighting each other at the same time Mm -hmm. that took a crazy amount of brain cells which I think I've left some on the table because of that and we pulled it off so I was crazy happy about that um, there's a lot of, you know, I mean, I think each episode has it. I like crazy shows. Right. <laughs> I, right. I tend to be like the crazier, the better. Um, but then there's shows that like I did American crime and like, I didn't have any emotion at all because everybody was in jail. And mm. John Ridley had said to me, embrace the stillness. Mm. And it was like, I mean, it was like um, it, it was like monumental to me as a director to hear that because I was the music video girl who moved the camera and moved people. And, and it was like, still this? And I learned something and grew as a director. So that episode will always mean something to me because um, I learned something about stillness and I will always take that with me. Right. I tend to gravitate to the shows that I learn something from or mm-hmm. advance my ability, my skill as a director. Um, so those three uh, stick out to me because of, the effort that we did. I mean, I recently did one of my favorite shows was, um, I did this episode of the show called preacher mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I had to have an actor Dominic in a coffin that was supposed to be in the bottom of a lake. And he's like MacGyvering trying to get out of it while it's water's coming in. And we had to figure out how to do that. And we had to build this three sided coffin and, submerge him in a thing and I had to like direct him while making sure that he didn't drown and wow. had the the grips were coordinating him bringing him down and up and he had, it was but we did it you know right. so when you do things like that and you go people look at it and it looks so simple that's the right. thing you look at it and everyone's like oh that was it was easy <laughs> it was you 10 seconds no, oh my god <laughs> and you have no idea what we had to do 
to make that look so simple. See, if we do it right, it looks really easy. If we do it wrong, you'll see the mistake. But if we do it right, it looks simple. And that's those are the shows that I remember because I remember all the effort to do something that everybody thought it was so easy. It just flashed right by him. It's like, you do not know how hard that was. And I will remember that moment forever as Dominique being submerged and me almost drowning him. And I was like, oh, I, I think he's drowning. <laughs> Don't drown number one. I was like, lift the coffin up now. And I was like, cut, cut, cut. <laughs> I was like he's really not breathing right now. Life or death. Yeah. Right. I, I got to look and see if I can get clips and, and cut to this stuff uh, during, the, during the podcast. I'm gonna look oh, that into would that. be cool. That would be dope. Um, all right. So three quick questions and then we out. Yes. Um, nah, lightning round question number one. What are you binging uh, during this quarantine time, if anything? <laughs> I binged. I've, I, you know, I've been working crazy, so I haven't binged that much. The last thing that I just watched, just yesterday, I watched the, oh my, the most, I'm on the screen for my kids. The most dangerous race, the eco challenge. Okay. I watched it, no one else watches. It was amazing. And now I want to do an eco challenge. But then I watched um, Never Have I Ever and mm -hmm. The Great. The Great were the two things that I watched on Hulu. And we're in the middle of Umbrella Academy, which I love. Okay. Okay. All of, I've heard nothing but good things about all of those after. I've seen a few Never Have I Ever episodes. I got to get it. back I in. I watched there. it with my kids. Yeah. That's what's up. We watched I, it every morning until we were done. And then we were like, hmm. oh my God. And the other one I love that no one's ever heard of is called the Dairy Girls. D-E-R-R-Y Girls. It's Irish. Okay. It's hilarious. My kids watch that too. Hilarious. Is, is that on uh, Hulu? I don't know. I think it's on Netflix, but it could okay. be on Hulu. I'm not sure. <laughs> not All right. Sure. I'll look that up. Um, I think it's funny as shit. But <laughs> and The Crown. I love The Crown. Yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, what three traits do you think are uh, a requirement for someone to make it in this industry? Perseverance. Three. Hmm. Perseverance. Thick skin. Confidence. No. Mm. Yes. <laughs> like, yes, no, yes, no, yes. Decisiveness? No. Right. Um I don't even know if there's a word, but um I think you have to believe in yourself and you have to believe you have to trust your gut. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. you're gonna hear so if you're a director in this industry, and even if you're an actor or a writer, you're gonna hear so there's so many voices that come mm -hmm. in at you. Mm -hmm. So many voices that wanna make you doubt what's in your spirit and in your soul, and a certain point. You have to, I say it all the time, I'm going to live and die by my own, own sword. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to trust my gut. And if I die by this sword, then I can say it's because I did it to myself. Not because I listened to some idiot who was afraid or had some other opinion. And that's the reason why I went down. So right. I think you have to have, you have to believe in yourself. Right. Yeah, that, that, you know, we, we've been pitching a show and there was a Kenya Barris quote from some interview I read where he was like, you know, the, no show ever sold because they took all the notes. <laughs> and I was like, that's a great way of looking at it. But you it's know? true. Yeah. Some notes are good, but some aren't. Yeah. And, and, and who knows where they're coming from. Right. And um, you have to be strong enough to say, I hear you, be respectful, mm -hmm. but then say, but I don't agree. Right. Right. And so the final one, um, you know, we talk to directors, actors, showrunners, uh, have yet to talk to some executives yet, but um, love to ask people who've been on the show who they who you think the next guest or a guest should be um, for us to have a conversation with about storytelling and this industry we're in. Hmm. Lawrence Fishburne. Hmm. Okay. Okay. I might be able to make that happen. <laughs> I did. I did. I, he's he's awesome, man. I, we could have some yeah. stories about him. But he, I had. Yes, a, I did a, like a pops centric episode uh, mm -hmm. in Blackish last season that was super fun. And he's like, yeah, I, he'll, he makes you like stand up straight. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I love Lawrence Fishburne. Yeah, I have so much love for him. I have respect for him as an artist. I have respect for him as a human being. Um, I think that he would be wonderful because he has so much history in this game. Mm, yeah. 
Um, and that's why I think it would be important for your viewers to hear from him, from someone yeah. who started when he was young and has survived in mm -hmm. this game. There's a lot of knowledge there. There's a lot of knowledge that Lawrence is keeping. Yeah. Um, that we haven't even tapped into. There's True so that. much. I mean, think about Cornbread Earl and me. That's when he started. Yeah. Yeah. Classics. Classics. All right. Well, Millicent Shelton, thank you for um, agreeing begrudgingly to <laughs> share your voice and likeness to Only the people. Only because you asked me. I was like, there's a reason why I'm behind the camera. I do not like my image or my voice recorded for anything ever. I, I, this is this is this is great. It's going to be down going down in the record books. Um, oh, and since uh, you know I, I shouted you out at the top, let me shout you out on the exit for um, you were one of the three people who signed my DGA paperwork. So <laughs> now I and now I know why. And I'm very proud of you. Uh, I, I appreciate it. Much love. Thank you. Thank you. you. What's up, people? This is Pete Chapman. Follow me on Instagram and on Twitter via at Pete Chapman. Follow the pod on Facebook on our Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman official page and hit up our mailbag with questions, suggestions, or hey, donations if you're feeling like it via Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman at gmail.com. And just in case you need to know how to spell it, that's Pete with the last name C-H-A-T-M-O-N. All right, so that was episode 16 of Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. Very, very thankful for the gems and wisdom and time of director Millicent Shelton and soon to be producer and hopefully writer. It sounds like she's got some cool things in the in the oven. So I'll be looking out for that. Um, I want to prepare you all for next week where we're going to get into a little bit more of a craft conversation from a different department head. Uh, and we are going to welcome Mr. Barry Alexander Brown, frequent collaborator with Spike Lee, edited, I, I should, I sh I'll, I'll do a tally for next week, but I think he's probably edited 20 of um, uh, projects with Spike, 20 of the, of the feature films with Spike. And um, we're gonna get into a really good conversation. Uh, I'll be live from, I'll be uh, recorded from Los Angeles and he'll be recorded from Martha's Vineyard. Um, and I, I look forward to sharing that with y'all. Uh, I wanna thank the team as always, Tristan Nash, my producer and editor, Jada George, our assistant producer, and my wife, Kelly McCreary, for making sure those announcements are popping. And uh, in the meantime, y'all, Stay safe, stay blessed, spread love, and, uh, you know, let, let's just keep up. Uh, let's stay focused as well. And um, I look forward to catching up with y'all next week. And uh, I'll just drop a little hint right now. Uh, since March, I've been working on a, on a passion project with uh, my frequent co writer and co-collaborator, Candace Sanchez McFarlane. And uh, it's going to be coming to y'all in a couple weeks. We will be uh, in production on that. Uh, we have a rehearsal tomorrow. We have production next weekend. Um, and uh, I, I really hope y'all support. So more to come on that. I'll dive into that a little bit more as we get closer. Um, but we got some heavy hitters involved in that. Um, and it's a really fun, interesting passion project with something to say. So, you know, little teaser right there. We out.